Today I'm going to talk to you about bit uh, about core data and feature mo team model, how it works together. Uh, it's a pretty vague title, but yeah, I, ho I hope it's going to get more clear once we get a bit into it. But before that, first I would like to talk a bit about SoundCloud's history. So two years ago, we had an app uh, in the App Store. It was SoundCloud version 2.7. And yeah, that was two years ago. Uh, it looked like something like this. Uh, it had like a lot of, it was pretty old. It was bloated with functionality in the player. Uh, it was mostly oriented for power users. The code base was supporting iOS 3 through iOS 7. So it was a big mess. It was a lot of hacks to support all that iOS versions. Uh, it was a code base we inherited and didn't quite knew what was it doing. Plus, on the other side, because it was supporting so many iOS versions, we couldn't keep up with the design requirements. So something had to be changed. We decided to, well, it was a longer decision, but eventually we decided to do a complete rewrite of the app. And we decided to release SoundCloud 3.0. Uh, that was a year ago when we released. And the app looks something like this now. Uh, it's much more suited to like normal usage when you're listening to the player. So it's all about that. The player is not, no longer bloated with features and call to engagement. It's pretty straightforward. With minimalistic UI and yeah, pretty nice flat design. From the code perspective, app was just like typical monolith app. It was supporting only iOS 7 through iOS 9 today. Uh, it's heavily relying on reactive Cocoa and we are using core data. How many of you have heard about reactive Cocoa or use it? Okay, cool. Yeah, so for those who haven't, um, just in layman's terms, it's just a framework, functional reactive programming framework, which makes your life easier when dealing with the synchronous workflow and with error handling. So for me, those are the strongest parts about Reactive Cocoa, uh, without going into deep. Uh, so core data, we decided to use core data. It was, we were doing some investigations early on in the start of the project. We were kind of thinking whether to use core data or go directly with SQLite because previous app used SQLite. So at some point we did a lot of investigations and decided let's go with core data because it can get us far really quick and it's something native to the platform which Apple supports. So it provided some simple things like getting data into table views, collection views, observing changes when something changes with track, we can easily update the collection view or something like that. So everything seemed okay and cool. And what changed since then is that team grew since then. Uh, we were only five people back then doing the rack development. And today we are counting 10 people working on iOS. And that's uh, quite a change. Apart from that, uh, product requirements grew since then in a sense that as time went on, we had more and more par parallel projects going on. And it was really hard to keep up on all of those requirements as one monolith theme. So basically more and more projects were popping up and everything was like being done halfway. Apart from that, usage grew ever since then. On this day, more or less 70% of overall monthly usage is coming from mobile apps on SoundCloud, uh, which kind of puts focus on iOS and mobile specifically. And it kind of like puts us in the spotlight and everyone has higher expectations that we need to be faster, do things more uh, better. Uh, so yeah, the idea then came to introduce feature teams and it was kind of company objective to move to more towards end-to-end -to -end, uh, development teams so we can tackle the issues I mentioned to move faster and to move, 
work more focused on one task. Uh, in that period, core team was assembled, uh, and core team's job was to tackle some bigger refactoring topics, some other concerns, together with API maintenance. Uh, feature teams were assembled to tackle on the feature requirements and all those parallel projects going on. Seems cool, but it wasn't painless. Uh, and kind of, it worked okay. Still kind of works, more or less. Uh, and yeah, one more thing, crash rate uh, remained the same throughout the release. So ever since the date we released to this day, which is more than a year, our crash rate sessions were 99.9%, which means we had only 0.1% of sessions crashing, which is a really good number. And we were analyzing those crashes. And what we figured out, most of them, of course we had some obvious bugs, but a lot of them were coming from core data. And those were the errors that shouldn't be happening, but were happening. For instance, crashing because object wasn't there, something was nil when it shouldn't be. So it was causing problems, core data specifically, and the bugs that we were experiencing were becoming more and more subtle. So it was really hard to debug because eventually it came down that it was threading issues and it happened only with big numbers. So we kind of decided to start looking into those crashes. So who am I to talk about all about this? Um, well, if you haven't noticed by my t-shirt, here's one big orange slide. Uh, I work for SoundCloud. Uh, if you don't know what SoundCloud is, it's just a platform where you can listen to music, discover new music, where creators can publish and monetize their tracks, where everyone can share their music. Uh, today, we have more than 175 mi million unique users per month and around 12 hours per day is being posted on SoundCloud every minute. So it's a pretty big numbers. I'm part of core team. My name is Slavko and I work closely with one more guy in my team, uh, Michael, who is somewhere in the audience. And we are not core team because we do core data. Uh, it's just because we are core to the platform. Uh, we mostly deal with our API, with some cross-cutting concerns, as I mentioned. We do some bigger refactorings, which are not just specific to one feature team. One of those is um, our data and sync layer, which we recently did and still are doing, which is currently backed by core data. And I'm sorry if you expected it, but this is not going to be a hate talk. This is just going to be our story, how we used core data, what problems we experienced, which may or may not be core data's problems. But yeah, it's just our story and how we try to solve that problems. So let me start by saying that like we used Reactive Coco together with core data. And once we when we started first, uh, Reactive Coco was super cool to us. So we tried to use it everywhere. We weren't super experienced with it, so a lot of the decisions that we did then were kind of wrong, which we noticed a bit later in the project. So yeah, so we kind of introduced Reactive Coco around core data on slightly wrong levels, which made our lives a bit harder once the project grew, when we introduced threading and stuff like that. So our initial implementation, and this is going to be simplified version, uh, what we did initially, just to try it out, uh, and how it used to work. So you had like a basic collection view controller or something. Once you needed data, it would just post a sync notification. Someone would catch that notification. It would go to the API, to save to database at, at some point it would return with a callback notification saying everything is done, here are your objects. So as you can see, it's pretty simple. Uh, we thought it's scalable and it is to some extent, um, but it had some issues when we tried to scale it. 
And the issue is that core data is not thread safe, as you probably know. And the objects you get on one thread, you should use it on that thread. So with Reactive Coco combined, it's super hard to tell, it was super hard for us to tell where the objects are coming from, which thread, where is it safe to use them. So we had a lot of like safeguards on objects where to use them. Our stack looked something like this. So we had a persistent store and it had two child contexts. Uh, main context, which was a main thread, which was used for reading. And we had a background context, which was used for writing mostly. And you can see in the top right corner, it had sync context. So basically sync context were children of background controller. And we did them as kind of means to having a atomic operations on core data. So if something doesn't succeed, so we don't pollute the database with half done objects. Uh, so we can just drop the sync context if something fails. Uh, simple sync. This is kind of like simplified class diagram of how it used to work. So, so as you can see, I'm going to go a bit through, not into depth, but you can see on the top right, we have an API layer and SoundCloud API layer. So what that means, we had like an API layer, which is generic, which can work with any API. Above that, we had a wrapper, which was specific for SoundCloud. And why we did it this way? Because at some point we had to support two APIs in parallel because we had a new version of API and the old version, which were returning some different objects. Uh, on the bottom, you can see an, an adapter, repository and core data. So how the thing used to work is, uh, as you can see on this image, sorry, here, uh, you would post a sync notification, it would go to the API, it would basically do a sync. So sync, when you got the sync, it would go to the API and it would return some API objects, uh, which were parsed with Mantle, a library for Objective-C to parse I uh, JSON files to models. And once we got those API objects, we would pass them to an adapter, which would adapt those API objects. So for instance, it would it would know how to uh, adapt two versions of an API track to one core data track. And then we would pass this to repository, which would save in the core data. Basically, it was doing uh, create, read, update, delete operations. So all of these errors that you, the arrows that you see are kind of subscriptions for the signals because everything was a signal. And basically, once the core data saved, we would pass through all the objects that we saved to the sync. So the problem here is that all those objects were created on background thread. And in some cases, we were using those on main thread, which was not good, but we have had workarounds how to fix that. Uh, it had some issues. It had a lot of issues when we started extensively deleting files. Uh, deleting uh, objects from the database because that caused some mayhem and some crashes all over the place. So again, we added some guards that would help us with that. Uh, so that's kind of like how it used to work. And then this concept of feature teams came in the into the play where we kind of had to move to feature teams right around the time when we started looking into how can we fix those issues. So we started, we said, let's look at it as one issue and try to fix it, but also make it work with feature teams. So we decided to start tackling those issues and we had two things in our mind. One was core data stack and how we can work with threading. And the other one, how can we get rid of mutable objects that you get from core data? So first step that we did, was restructure the stack. Uh, and now it looks like this. It, it's more streamlined, and main context is now just the child of background context. This was done in a way uh, because in some cases we saw that uh, because we were heavily relying on notifications, 
uh, that they were kind of out of sync when things were really saved. So we had some crashes where we expected an object, but it wasn't saved yet. And this restructuring helped with those problems because now everything was going through the main context. And the background thread was just propagating the saves to the disk. So it, it worked pretty well, and it still works. And it's easier to grasp this model because it's more streamlined. And yeah. So second step was thinking about domain models. Because we kind of like, when you have an app, it usually looks like this. So for instance, you have a track and a user in the database. So you can have a player view controller, search view contro controller, or stream view controller. And all of them need to display username and, and track title, which means they all need to know about track and user, which creates a mess with these errors. Arrows. Uh, so concept in domain models, we said, let's create models that will represent just what the screen needs, not anymore. So that would mean something like this. On a player view controller, you would have an artist name, title, stream URL, like count, is liked, image URL. This is the all the info that you need to display a player view controller. You don't need any more. So let's turn this into a player track model. And once we did that, we had an idea what we want to do. So basically, once you start thinking like this, you figure out that you need some wrapper around core data, which would map core data objects into some in-memory objects, which would be immutable and contain only the info that you need. So as a first step, because we want to do step-by-step -step refactor, not Big Bang, we decided to split the work into reading and writing. So uh, basically what that means is if you have a model like this, where you have a database on one end and an app on the other end. Reading and writing are a bit different in a sense, and the scale in which you do reads is not the same as the scale you do writes. And it's inherently different operation, so we didn't want to tie them together like Core Data does. If you want to save something in Core Data, you change the object and save the object. We didn't want to do that. So, uh, we said, let's tackle this read path. And then after that is done, let's tackle the syncing layer, which is basically writing to the disk or core data. So for the read path, we had some requirements. One of those was it should work nicely with Reactive Cocoa. We learned a lesson that we introduced Reactive Cocoa on different, on wrong levels. So we wanted to fix that because Reactive Coco helps you with asynchronous workflow. And reading and writing from the database is inherently asynchronous. So we wanted to use Reactive Coco for that. We wanted to replace NSFetch results controller, uh, but we still wanted to use something like that. We wanted to have changes propagated to the screens every time something changes. We wanted to map core data objects into immutable in-memory objects, which was a hard requirement because we didn't want to change them once they were loaded from the database. And as I said, it should be able to react to changes, even on related objects, which means it should be more powerful than NSFetch results controller because it doesn't support changes on related objects. So if you have a track which is loaded, and it's tied to a user. If user changes, you won't get an update on that screen. We wanted that. So just simply how it works, uh, it's kind of like this. You have a, for instance, search view contro controller, which needs to display some tracks, sorry, search items. So it will say, get me the search items to a search service where the search service will assemble the request, which is kind of um, abstracted away NSFetch request. And this request controller would then do a fetch call to core data fetcher, which means like request controller will create an actual implementation of NSFetch request and propagate it to the core data fetcher. One thing here, 
is this coordinates of fetcher keeps observing the changes that we are interested in. So again, the arrows are subscriptions, and everything is tied into one stream of signals. So once the coordinate does the fetching, it will return the mapped items through a signal. But it will still continue to observe the notifications. So let's say this same notification would come in. Coordinate fetcher would respond to it, and it will check what has saved and whether we are interested in those changes. If we are, it will just again propagate the stuff that we're interested in. So basically, this is how we solve the NS fetch results controller problem, where we need to react to every change. And it works really nice. You would probably ask now a question, but what if you don't have anything in the database? Well, if you don't have any items in, in the database, uh, basically what you, what, what you do then is the right path, which is syncing. And so syncing is the right path. And we also had some requirements for that. And we said we don't want to change the objects and then save that object. What that means, our objects is, are immutable. So we want to keep them that way. Another requirement, we don't want to drift too far from core data because we are still using core data and we want to optimize it. And in order to do that, we need to be close to it. So that wasn't an option to just make some abstract framework that would do something magical with core data. <coughs> Another thing that we wanted to do is to make it extendable to support some future use cases. Uh, so for now, we defined three use cases that we mostly use throughout the app. Uh, one is read data from the API and write it to core data. That's just simple, let's load the list of items. You would make a call to the API, get 20 items back and write them to core data. Another one is write something to core data, make an API call, and revert if that API call fails. That's uh, basically liking action. Uh, so basically, if you don't have a network, it would still work seamlessly on the phone, just because it's going to be posted at some later point. And the idea is that when you like, we save it to core data, so it displays properly on the UI. We post an API call. If that fails, we'll just roll back the action. And the third use case is just writing to core data. This is just some local operation which doesn't need to go to the API or anything. <coughs> so how does simple sync look like? Is this. So this is kind of the whole sync that we do. And three lines of code. It's a bit more hidden inside, but still. So basically what you do, uh, you do an API call, and through a signal, you get a response, which is a list of API objects. Once you have them, you will pass it to a command, which will do some core data operation or whatever. So this is a command. Uh, it's also a signal. And as you can see, it has adapter which adapts that collection, which means basically it will take the API objects and turn them into uh, core data objects in an optimized way, synchronous way, and yeah, everything will work. After that, we will just save the context and everything will work. The thing you can notice here is that we never return objects that were delivered from the API. And that was like, that was a design, design decision because we wanted to have a unidirectional flow of data, which means when we write, we write. When we read, we read. And if we are interested in changes, continuous changes, we will do that through the reading path. And it kind of looks like this on this graph. And what that means is, for instance, in terms of liking, uh, you would like something in the database, and basically what you would do is you would just set a flag 
in the core data object. And how this change would be propagated to the UI is because the read request that you have set up on your view controller would be set up to observe the changes from the core data. Once you save that like, it will trigger a save change and it will propagate down to the UI. And this way we have this unidirectional flow of data, which makes it more s super easy to visualize the data and the data flow. There is no, oh, uh, someone changed my object and I accidentally saved it. Or I changed an object in one place and someone somewhere else saved my context. So there are no changes like that. You would be wondering why are we do doing all this? And kind of the reason why we are doing this is, if you remember, I mentioned feature teams. So one of the reasons why we were thinking in this way is because we wanted to modularize the app. Because we noticed that people are stepping on each other's toes when they were doing some code that, were, that was only theirs. So this approach works really well with modularizing the app. Because what we can do now is, if you look at in terms of search, we can extract search as a feature above the SoundCloud app. And all that search needs search as a feature or a library needs to know needs to know about its domain object, which is search item. So inside of its own world, it knows that it deals with search item. From the SoundCloud app, it just needs to know that it can provide its search items. And for writing, it just needs to know that it has a sync, which can save to wherever it needs to save. So those are two things. And if you expand it with two more things, which is an API call and a launcher, you get like a module configuration object, which basically tells the feature how it should behave. And with that, we get plug and play modules. And what that means is that we can split up the app and just plug in modules that we want in our app. Uh, for authentication, for instance, if we have that, we can hook it up to some other app because authentication knows that it deals with, for instance, authenticated user, and SoundCloud app knows how to provide those authenticated user from its core data database, and some other app can provide it from an XML file, but it can still provide them, which means that authentication can work without knowing what's its backing storage. Uh, doing this approach has some hidden benefits on productivity, which I will list now, and one of those is that each team can now have its own life cycle where the team can maintain its own tests. They can release whenever they want, when they feel ready. Uh, removing, adding, changing a feature is just a matter of configuration because we also have feature flags, which you can just turn and off features as you want. So it becomes simple. Uh, one more thing, it can significantly reduce CI time uh, because once you extract the whole search feature, there's no need to run any tests on it if you don't change it, especially the UI tests, which take most of the time. Uh, there are some takeaways from the whole story. And yeah, uh, Core Data, despite everything, has its benefits and it can get you far can get you really far if you know what you're doing. Uh, but you need to learn its abilities. And I would suggest you try to talk to people who already used it. I don't think they would have a good opinion, but still. Uh, you should assess how it, it will in impact your app. And just don't go blindly uh, thinking it's going to solve all your problems. And after all, it's just like one giant black box. And you don't know what's happening inside. Uh, once you have it, it's hard to remove, but it's not impossible. And it's a big effort. But now that we have this architecture in place, I'm personally not super worried about having core data because 
I know we can easily switch it for something else. Uh, one more thing is when you're abstracting away from your storage by using core data or anything else, you lose flexibility. And that's what we noticed with core data because wha when you want to optimize something, when you know with direct SQL that you can optimize, there's no way to do it with core data. And mm -hmm. you need to accept that if you're using core data. But yeah, abstracting away, you get less f flexibility. Another thing is know the scope of your project, uh, how far it will get you, and whether you can invest in something else rather than core data. We didn't have time for that, but probably I think the whole team would agree if we were starting now, we would definitely not use core data. And <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and yeah, for the end, uh, one more thing is just know your framework, know what you're doing with it. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. There are three more colleagues from SoundCloud here. They're sitting somewhere there. Uh, you can ask them anything, like me. And yeah, any questions, concerns, <laughs> answers? I have a question. Uh, why do you don't use magical record? It's magical. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, we, we never looked really into it, but we're kind of weary of anything that has magic in uh, its name. But as I see, it uh, provides this structure uh, that uh, you try to make uh, when you do your refactoring. Yeah, so I'm you can uh, not don't spend a lot of time to build this. Well. To be honest, we didn't spend a lot of time building this. The the thing that took time was actually adapting all the code base to work the new way. So that took most of the time. Coming up with an architecture, it's half a day of sitting down and drawing on the paper. Okay, thank you. Didn't you have troubles with the speed of the core data? Because we are handling quite a lot of data and we found out that core data is slow for us. So we had to use something more SQI um, nearby like FMDB. Yeah, so we had performance issues. We tried to mitigate them. But at the end, what I mentioned, we are stuck with core data for now. So we cannot just run away from it. We need to live with it. But yeah, it definitely has performance issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe we have opinion of in debate in core data versus realm. Yeah, haven't haven't looked into Realm. You can speak with my colleague, he did uh, investigation with Realm, uh, but yeah, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so okay. I think okay. that's it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.